August 5th, 1873, southwestern Nebraska. A group of Pawnee hunters crouched low in prairie grass so as not to betray their silhouettes against the pre-dawn skyline. They are led by a respected tribal leader, Sky Chief. Among the hunters is Sky Chief's young son, a boy of no more than six or seven years old. Though too young to participate in the hunt, he is excited and proud to be along with this group of grown men that would see them through another harsh plains winter. The Pawnee had once been a formidable force on the central plains of the North American continent. In the early 1700s, they had numbered 60,000 people and controlled vast swaths of what is today the American Midwest. But after almost two centuries of disease and warfare, their numbers had dwindled to a few thousand. By 1873, they acquiesced to the U.S. government's attempts to confine them to the reservation lands of Nebraska. This buffalo hunt, a long-standing tradition amongst the tribe, had only been granted to them in the previous few years as a last opportunity to practice their ways and to fortify their winter food supply at little to no cost to the federal government. The year prior, in 1872, they had been accompanied by a contingent of agency scouts led by Texas Jack Guhomodoro a legendary scout, cowboy, eventual actor, and longtime friend of Buffalo Bill Cody. As the agency scouts stood watch and provided protection to the camp, the Pawnee men were able to venture out and hunt without fear of retributive attacks from their longtime enemy, the Sioux. Under the watchful eye of well-armed and experienced sentries, the Pawnee had managed to procure enough buffalo meat to get them through the upcoming winter. However, the Sioux had raided their reservation incessantly during the winter of 1872 to 1873, and the Pawnee suffered greatly as a result. In the springtime, the Pawnee chiefs had conferred and decided that another hunt was indeed wholly necessary for the survival of the tribe. They petitioned the federal agents of the reservation for another contingent of scouts. They requested these scouts be led by Texas Jack, as he had comported himself so reputably during the summer prior and solidified a lifelong respect and companionship between himself and the Pawnee. In the interim time between the summer of 1872 and the spring of 1873, several major changes had occurred in the administration of the main Pawnee reservation, the Genoa Agency in northeastern Nebraska. First, a new superintendent had been installed. His name was William Burgess, and like his predecessors since 1869, he was a Quaker. President Ulysses S. Grant had installed Quakers as Indian agents in the hopes that contact with pacifist, peaceable whites would quell the raging frontier violence that had plagued the continent for centuries and stalled American expansion for decades. Grant, in fact, believed the root cause of much of the violence on the bleeding frontier was due to the treatment of the native tribes by overly aggressive, needlessly bellicose, and haplessly short-sighted settlers. Grant hoped this plan would stem the tide of violence that, at times, seemed like it might overrun a third of the country. But he was gravely disappointed. From the very start, William Burgess had not inspired confidence in his leadership abilities. Luther North, a revered member of the scouts that served the reservation, described Burgess as woefully unqualified, noting that, quote, his judgment where the Pawnee are concerned, if anything, is poorer than any of the other agents the Pawnees have ever had. Burgess had attempted to address the terrible conditions at the reservation by passing out annual rations earlier than promised, but this proved an inadequate solution to the poverty and starvation that plagued the tribe. Feeling as though he had little other feasible course of action, Burgess authorized the tribe to travel to the Republican River in hopes of repeating the previous year's hunting success and placating the Pawnee for one last year until they could be brought fully to bear as idealized American citizens. The plans for the excursion began in the late spring, with the initial intent being to repeat the steps taken in the previous year's hunt. Texas Jack was asked to lead the agency's scouting party, and a wave of much-needed hopefulness spread through the desperate hungry camp as spring turned into summer. However, due to an administrative snafu on behalf of the reservation agents, 
the Pawnee were ultimately unable to secure Texas Jack's services in time. Though he had repeatedly applied to lead the Pawnee party, no word had come in return. With no confirmatory word from the Indian agency, Texas Jack had signed on to appear in Buffalo Bill Cody's stage show in New York and was thus drawn away by his new obligation. The Pawnee, now bereft of an agency representative that they considered trustworthy in the field, beseeched Burgess to grant the position to a 22-year-old Wisconsin-born homesteader named John W. Williamson. Williamson had signed on that spring as an agriculturalist for Fort Genoa and had solidified a mutually congenial relationship with the Pawnee. Williamson had no experience in guiding the trail, no experience in the territory, spoke only passable Pawnee, and, being all too keenly aware of these facts himself, had never applied for nor expressed any interest in leading the Pawnee hunting expedition. The Pawnee hoped that this might work in their favor, as Williamson's lack of territorial and tactical wherewithal would likely mean drastically less strict practices than those employed by Texas Jack. The Pawnee had ventured out from Fort Genoa in a party of roughly 400, mostly women and children. They had made their way, in high spirits, to the hunting grounds on the Republican River, believing themselves adequately protected and free of some of the previous year's burdensome restrictions. Initially, the hunt had been a rousing success. In the month leading up to this day, the Pawnee had managed to harvest roughly 800 buffalo. Each animal killed meant a measure of security for their families, and all present had thus far been pleased with the progress. On this day, though, something was different. The air seemed unusually thick, and the buffalo more skittish than usual. The evening prior, a group of white buffalo hunters had stopped by the Pawnee encampment. They had warned Williamson and Sky Chief that they had seen a large encampment of the Pawnee's mortal enemy, the Sioux, 25 miles up the river. They warned that the Sioux party was clearly on the warpath and undoubtedly on the hunt for the Pawnee. Word had spread quickly that the Pawnee were back this summer on the Republican River, land the Sioux held to be rightfully theirs. They said the Sioux were incensed and out for blood. Sky Chief had scoffed at this notion and decried the hunters as simply more lying white men trying to keep him and his people from their rightful hunting grounds and bounties. But as he hunkered down watching the buffalo herd and mindfully keeping his young son close to him, Sky Chief began to wonder if those hunters had in fact been telling the truth. Then he heard the hoofbeats. Suddenly, a party of fifty Sioux warriors on horseback and in full regalia, crested the ridge. Almost instantaneously, the two parties, Sioux and Pawnee, were in sight of each other. Some accounts have Sky Chief and his warriors as being in the middle of skinning some of the buffalo they had already killed. However, in either account, the Pawnee were caught wholly unprepared to defend themselves. It was clear at a moment's glance that this party of Sioux were the initial scouts sent out to find and make first contact with the Pawnee. Sky Chief knew exactly what this meant. As the Sioux let loose their piercing war cries and barreled down the ridge towards them, the Pawnee knew there would be no surviving this morning. Sky Chief, a decades-long veteran of some of the most intense intertribal conflict on the plains, decided then and there what he had to do. With the initial volleys of Sioux arrows raining down around him, cutting down his longtime friends and cohorts, Sky Chief unsheathed his long hunting knife. He drew his young son close to him one last time, screamed to the oncoming Sioux that they would not kill his son, then ended his own son's life by his own hand. Moments later, Sky Chief and the remainder of his forces were cut down. The Sioux reported taking no prisoners from this contingent, leaving all Pawnee present dead to a man. The battle that ensued there was undoubtedly fierce, for every man present knew that the fate of their families, were they not able to defend them, would be the same as that of Sky Chief's son. Having located the Pawnee, the Sioux reconnaissance party of roughly 100 warriors made their way back to the main contingent of Sioux, roughly 1,000 strong 
hidden behind the bluffs a few miles away. These Sioux, under the leadership of War Chief's Little Tail and the aptly named Pawnee Killer, immediately headed out towards the remainder of the Pawnee. The Pawnee, with only 100 warriors left and the rest being women and children, were making their way languidly down a canyon near the Republican River when the Sioux smashed into them in a whirlwind of violence and bloodshed. The remaining warriors who stood and fought were cut down. Williamson and two older Pawnee men managed to make an escape back to the west in hopes of linking up with the nearest U.S. Army element and procuring assistance. However, they would not make it in time. The Pawnee had retreated into the canyon and were now trapped within its recesses. Old women, young mothers, children, and babies were ruthlessly hunted down, yanked from their hiding spots, and clubbed, stabbed, or shot to death. Sexual assault of female victims was the norm on the plains, as was the killing of any potential prisoner who might be found burdensome at any point. Such was the case on this day. One can only imagine the living nightmare that raged on in the canyon. Many mothers of young children killed their own, rather than have them fall into the hands of the Sioux. A number of prisoners were taken, and any valuables that could be carried were tied to horses. Then, almost as suddenly as they had struck, the Sioux were off, over the hills, and free from retribution. Only hours later, in the afternoon of August 5th, U.S. cavalry soldiers who had been alerted by Williamson and his cohorts arrived on the scene. Riding with them was Army Dr. David Franklin Powell. He counted 59 Pawnee dead. Visitors from nearby towns who had been alerted to the events and come to see the aftermath themselves remembered significantly more. Correspondent Royal Buck of the Nebraska City News wrote that it was a massacre and nothing more and near 100 victims are lying on the ground now, a full two-thirds of which are squaws and papooses. On August 8th, news of the massacre reached the Pawnee back at Fort Genoa. For days afterwards, the fort was a cacophonous scene as the weeping and lamentations of the Pawnee women filled the air. A few Pawnee who had managed to escape the canyon made their way 80 miles to what's known as Plum Creek, an offshoot of the Platte River. Here, they were tended to by Dr. William M. Bancroft and put on a train back to Fort Genoa. For weeks afterwards, Sioux warriors were spotted in various camps displaying their war trophies. What had been a horrific, infanticidal massacre to the Pawnee was a just and necessary victory in the eyes of the Sioux. Sioux accounts of the battle report as many as 300 Pawnee being killed, with no Sioux casualties being taken. Regardless of the disparity in accounts, it is certain that this was a monumental victory for the Sioux. From their point of view, these were the just deserts of the Pawnee who had stolen so much from them and killed so many of those that they loved. The events of Massacre Canyon in 1873 were indeed unique, but not in their level or scope of violence, nor the intensity of the hatred between the two tribes nor in the grief inflicted and suffered by both. Massacre Canyon would be unique because it would mark the last great battle between major plains tribes on the North American continent. But violence like that wrought at Massacre Canyon was nothing new to the Old West. The stories of warfare, raiding, violence, and atrocities between tribes are too numerous to count and too important to forget. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. But what did you think? Was Sky Chief right to do what he did? Were the Sioux bloodthirsty killers or out for justifiable vengeance? Is there a bad guy here? Is there a good guy? Can this level of violence ever be justified? Let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, Click that notification bell, and we'll see you here next time on History at the OK Corral, History to Real.